one of the most universal experiences amongst us humans are the moments spent gazing into the cosmic time map of the stars. Many of us have wondered if other life exists. How did it all begin? What does this all mean? These questions drove me to the stars from a very young age, and by grade school I was already reading college level literature in everything relating to astronomy and astrophysics. Still, my hunger for knowledge was insatiable. For every question answered, ten more would sprout in its place. Why are we here? How did life come to be in such hellish conditions? What about space itself? Could life exist out there in the freezing black void? The answer isn't what you'd expect. You have no reason to believe a word I say. And even so, this message may not reach you at all. But I won't let our sacrifices go unheard. I have to leave a record in case I don't make it back to tell you this myself. I have to try. For everyone back home on Earth. For Dr. Bigham. For Weaver. Our mission was top secret. Our purpose and destination unknown. Until just before launch. We were told we were selected to test the first spacecraft constructed for faster than light travel. The mythical all kubir drive, my mentor and colleague, Dr. Avon Bigham, through some miracle of science and technology, had created it. Ever the stubborn mule, Dr. Bigham only reluctantly invited the world's most elite scientists and engineers to finalize the ship's construction and personally selected the crew from a pool of participants around the globe. Dr. Bigham had been my hero when I was attending university. He had such a fire in his soul for astronomy and would reject all absolutes when it came to physics. Nothing is impossible, was his mantra. He would talk endlessly about how faster than light travel could be possible, how humanity could harvest the power of black holes and become the titans of the universe. It was our destiny. His passion was infectious, and so I made it my own life's goal to see humanity finally gain access to the stars. Our endless nights and research finally paid off with the creation of the space research vehicle, Arkham. I was in complete shock, and didn't think any of it was real. Not when we arrived on Luna to begin basic training, not when we arrived on Titan to begin final preparations. Not until the moment when I was floating naked in the suspended animation tank, preparing for our four-year trip to the edge of the solar system. There, our journey would truly begin. Hypersleep, in actuality, was nothing like any movie or program I had ever seen. There was nothing to keep me warm for the 20 minutes it would take to enter hypersleep. My eyes were bound shut with surgical tape, so my only sensation was the piercing cold of the sub-zero degree water. The pain was excruciating, but the only reminder that I was even still alive. I was sure I would die before stasis was triggered, but in that same second, it finally happened, and I felt the inky black of space completely take over. For once, I was happy to be asleep. I don't remember a single dream I've ever had, having been an insomniac for much of my life. But I remember the dream from hypersleep. I was lost at sea. The ocean was deep black and was almost bottomless. There was a sky, but its deep midnight purple hue was almost indistinguishable from the black sea. The darkness masked the shadow of the many creatures I could sense just inches below my feet. Once or twice, I felt what seemed like rows of teeth running ever so softly down my legs. It could have been for just a moment, or maybe an eternity. But without warning or pain, I was pulled downward and plunged straight into the abyss. I didn't dare open my eyes. All I could do was pray for a quick death. 
The first sense I regained was the wave of warmth that washed over my exposed, waterlocked body. I couldn't see yet, but I could feel my fingers were soaked and rubbery from such a long submersion. Quickly afterward, I became aware of a flurry of voices. Some were muffled and distant. Another was close and clearer. It was Weaver, our medical technician, just awakening from hypersleep himself. I remember that he'd been the first doctor to practice on Mars, and as my eyes opened slowly and his nearly perfect physique, at even 50 plus years of age, was alluring and helped me bring my other senses into focus. Without warning, my ears were filled with sharp shooting pain. The blaring alarm overhead quickly forced the remaining fogginess to retreat. I knew this alarm. I had heard it before. It was the life support fail system Dr. Bigham and I had designed together. A growing dread replaced the momentary excitement I had only felt seconds ago. I turned over quickly, splashing water everywhere, to see who it was. It was Dr. Bigham. It had happened only once before in recorded spaceflight. But he went into cardiac arrest the exact moment he entered stasis. His heart was now failing without the machines to keep him alive. Weaver was the first to reach him and frantically began performing CPR. It was all in vain, as the all too familiar sound of a flatlining heart monitor were the only things we could hear outside Weaver's desperate pleas. Roberts, the ship's captain, rushed to stop Weaver's endless compressions, knowing it was too late. The next few hours were a haze as the rest of the crew awakened and processed how to go forward. There was a plan, as there always was. There was no joy to be had logging into the mainframe to assume the title of chief science officer. I had hoped to one day lead my own expedition into the void. I never wanted it to be like this. As the other crew were grieving and dealing with post-stasis recovery, I turned the ship on sector by sector and began plotting our course. That's when I noticed it. It was peculiar at first. I wasn't quite sure what to make of it. I tried to align the ship with Alpha Centauri, but the ship's computers kept failing to plot a course. I knew I was doing everything correctly. My very soul had been embedded into this ship. I knew every circuit and every switch on the bridge. Troubled, I looked out into the expanse of interstellar space that lay right in front of me. My eyes searched for familiar constellations and areas I knew I would recognize. Once I found one, I tried tracing it back to the spot where I knew Alpha Centauri was. Only, I didn't find it. I searched every point in the sky. But no matter how long I searched, I could not find Alpha Centauri anywhere. This was impossible. Surely, some kind of post-traumatic stress from the voyage in stasis, and now Dr. Bigham's unfortunate passing. As far as our scans could detect, our destination had gone dark. An unease unlike anything I'd ever experienced crept over me. The mysterious nature of our mission and lack of any details before launch was starting to make sense. Dr. Bigham must have known how many others knew? What else had the doctor been hiding? I said nothing as the rest of the crew silently entered the presentation room. Roberts was doing her best to maintain appearances. But rumors of romance with the doctor had been floating around for months before our launch. Now her stark and blank expression was more worrying than normal. Captain, I need to address the crew. I was shaky and unsure as I spoke. Roberts was a commanding figure within the crew, a known nonsense stronghold of a woman who could drink me under the table before beating me over the head with it. It can wait until after the briefing. Her words were stern and cut through the bone. I'm sorry, with all due respect, but it can't wait. There's something I've just discovered and that was an order, Blair. Now, please start the presentation and have a seat. You may speak after the briefing. Her words were a swift rebuke of my desperate pleas. For me, 
that confirmed she already knew what Dr. Bigham was about to posthumously tell us. Quietly, I obeyed her instructions and started the recorded memos the late doctor had left. His haggard face flashed up on the screen. The deep ridges in his skin prominent and his hazel eyes looking straight into the camera from behind his absurdly oversized glasses. There was a deadly seriousness to his expression. A rarity for him. Whatever the reason for Alpha Centauri's sudden disappearance, it was taking quite the effect on him. The knot of anxiety and dread that had formed in my stomach was now twisting into a monumental sense of grave danger for all of us. Fellow crew of the Arkham, it will have been my greatest failure should these recordings ever reach you. For all it means that my life's work and my journey alongside you to Alpha Centauri have failed. Now, I must place upon you the most terrible of burdens. His words dripped with both heartache and a slowly rising fear. I could hear nothing but the labored breaths of my crew as we listened. By now, you have cleared the Oort Cloud and are in the final preparations to perform the very first hyperspace jump using the immaculately designed jump drive of my own creation. You know this to be your primary and only objective to oversee the first successful faster than light voyage to our closest stellar neighbor, the star system designated Alpha Centauri, then return home. This is only half true. The bomb, the one we were all waiting for. Of course, there had been more to this mission than just simply testing the drive. Why else had a heavily decorated military commander with extensive combat experience be made the captain of a scientific mission? I looked over at Captain Roberts and was surprised to meet her gaze in return. Her attention could not be further away from Dr. Bigham's posthumous presentation. Instead, she appeared to be studying me, looking for my reaction. Maybe she thought I knew as well that Dr. Bigham had already told me before the mission. My confused and puzzled face must have surprised her as she turned away the same second our eyes had met. What you're about to hear is considered top secret by every recognized sovereign body on Earth. Four years before the start of our voyage, an amateur astronomer reported a strange finding to NASA. It seemed that our nearest stellar neighbor, Alpha Centauri, had suddenly and without warning vanished from sight. There was a murmur of conversation amongst the crew now. An entire star system vanished? Impossible. Surely a miscalculation. Hearing these words coming from Dr. Bigham's mouth, I still didn't believe it. There was no precedent for this. A star cannot simply vanish, especially not the star closest to us. Dr. Bigham paused for a few moments, allowing us to absorb the full weight of what his words meant. I noticed his hands trembling, a condition he had kept hidden from most. They hadn't stopped shaking the entire video. Repeated attempts to locate the binary star system have all failed. Proxima Centauri, the third member of the system, is still detectable, but we have been receiving strange oddities and fluctuations in output. You may remember some years back when astronomers reported similar findings from Tabby's star. Your primary destination is now Proxima Centauri. Specifically, the region of the planet located within the Red Dwarf's habitable zone. You will make your initial observations there. A crew of two will then board the ship's emergency shuttle, which has also been outfitted with a jump drive and charter route to the site of Alpha Centauri. You will record any data there is to be obtained, then report back to the Arkham. If all succeeds, you will then chart a course back to your present location to begin the journey back to Titan. The severity of your situation must not be underestimated. There is no natural or physical phenomenon that we have ever recorded that is remotely capable of producing this anomaly. Besides, there is something even more disturbing. I've traced star maps from all across history, and there is a direct line of stars that have all seemingly disappeared throughout the galaxy that led directly to Alpha Centauri. This anomaly 
whatever it is, does appear to be spreading. I'm sure I don't have to tell you which system is closest to Proxima Centauri. Also, there is the nature of the jump drive themselves. All you need to know is that they are powered by an extremely volatile engine, and miscalculations and impact debris are high risk factors. So you must proceed with the utmost caution. You are all truly in no man's land now. The doctor took a long pause, perhaps growing weary from the weight of this information. He ran his hands through his thinning curly grey hair, then took one final look at the camera. One can only hope these files never reach you, and that we will together solve this mystery. But if not, if these truly are my last words to you, then Godspeed. With that, the screen went blank, and a heavily uncomfortable silence cloaked the entire room. The one sound that registered with me were the occasional beeps from the ship. Roberts was the first to speak up. Blair, you may now address the crew. She said with just a hint of sarcasm. No need now. Dr. Bigham pretty much covered it. I said blankly, still locked into a gaze with the blank screen. My mind was racing over the possibilities, over what could have happened to Alpha Centauri and the other stars Dr. Bigham had mentioned. What was more troubling to me was the mention of Tabby Star, which has indeed recorded bizarre fluctuations in light output. Some have speculated that an advanced alien race could be constructing a Dyson Swarm around the star, though no solid theories have ever been conclusively proven or disproven. This was something completely different though. Tabby Star was still detectable, whereas two whole stars from a system were now entirely gone. Proxima Centauri, a low-mass red dwarf, appeared to be next, but as it was not visible to the naked eye, we would have no idea of what we would see until we got there. Roberts took notice of the shocked expression of the entire crew, and for the first time, spoke with just the slightest hint of concern in her voice. Dr. Bigham left detailed instructions for everyone to follow in the event of his death. Does anyone have any questions before we begin? It didn't take long for the first protest to start. Torrance, the ship's pilot, and Roberts, second in command, was the first. Are you kidding me? This is insane. There is no way we can go through with this mission now that we just lost our only scientist. His fear and anger were clear as he almost spat through his teeth. Torrance and I had once both been peers of Dr. Bigham before I was chosen to be his assistant. Our already fragile and competitive relationship quickly soured after that, and Torrance threw himself head first into piloting. I agree, we have no clue what to expect when we get there, and now we've lost Dr. Bigham. I think we should test the jump drive to get back to Seoul. It would be a far better course of action now, in light of what's happened. I was surprised to hear Weaver joining in with Torrance. Weaver had a reputation for being rash and making risky choices that ended up saving countless lives. But now, he too was cloaked in the same fear everyone else was. We cannot risk damaging the ship by flying through the Oort Cloud. That's precisely why we had to wait until we had cleared it to begin the mission. As you have already been told, there are specific instructions. Torrance cut Roberts off which was something no one had ever dared to do. The rest of the crew, shocked at his bravado, just looked on as their dispute continued to escalate. I don't care, this is well beyond normal circumstances. Not only is the man who built this ship dead, but this whole mission was also all a lie. I would have never signed up for this if I had known the truth, and I'm sure most of you wouldn't have either. Torrance looked to be out of breath as he finished. He was scared. I could tell. Whatever concern and humanity Roberts had displayed earlier was swiftly replaced with her usual icy demeanor. But you did sign up for this mission. You signed an ironclad contract. Now of course I cannot force you to participate. Our superiors are trillions of miles away. If you refuse however, 
we will forcibly place you back into stasis until the completion of this mission and I'll return to Titan, where you will be placed under arrest and stripped of your title, status and all privileges. I have to admit, there was something provocative and sensual the way Robert took control of any situation. I could see Torrance beginning to shrink in the presence of such a commanding woman. No doubt the both of them wanted to curb stomp the other. Still, Torrance had never been able to read the room. And so he continued on his tirade. I'd like to see you try. Seriously, I'll fight every single one of you. No one's forcing me to do anything. Torrance was really trying to put on a brave front. But it just shattered completely in the face of someone who was clearly bigger, more powerful and more intimidating than him. If someone didn't interject soon, this was not going to end well. As Roberts began making a motion towards Torrance, thinking on my feet, I jumped up to place myself between the two. Stop, both of you, this isn't helping. My voice was shaky and I didn't feel near the confidence I was trying to project. Roberts, taken aback, could only stare at me with her mouth slightly agape. Torrance, however, looked poised to attack at any moment. My feet stood firm though, and I continued. Torrance, I know you're scared. I'm scared too. You heard what Dr. Begum said. This isn't about us. It's about everyone else back on Earth. Screw you, Blair. What else do you know? You had your hand so far up Dr. Begum's ass. He must have told you everything. Torrance was becoming even more aggressive. I knew it was only a matter of time before Roberts forced her way back between us. I didn't know, I swear, I only found out just before you did. I wouldn't have agreed to come either had I known the truth. I lied, hoping Torrance would take the bait. Nothing short of a gamma ray burst would have stopped me from joining this mission. We all signed the same contract, Torrance, and there are 10 billion people that are counting on us. Not to mention everything that will be within our grasp once this ship is fully activated. The whole Milky Way galaxy, Andromeda, the local group, maybe even the entire observable universe. I know you Torrance, and I know there's no way you wouldn't want to be a part of that. We need you. I stopped, allowing Torrance to absorb what I had just said. His shoulders began to relax, and I could sense his breathing returning to normal. Roberts looked on suspiciously. Well, now that we've all regained composure, we will initiate the first jump to Proxima Centauri in T-1 hour. You may begin your preparations. Dismissed. Roberts didn't stay any longer and disappeared into her personal quarters. Not able to stand the thought of everyone staring at me, I left without a word and headed to the bridge. As I mindlessly brought all the systems online, the only thing I could think about was Alpha Centauri. Nothing but titanic darkness lay in the spot where our closest neighbor once was. What could have possibly caused an entire binary star system to disappear? The only real option in my head was some sort of black hole encounter. Maybe a rogue black hole that remained undetected disrupted the system, sending Alpha Centauri A and B into interstellar space. Even that remote possibility stretched my suspicion of disbelief well beyond its limits. The bridge doors opened, but I didn't register it at first, so the hand on my shoulder was quite a jolt. I jumped back to see Sydney, the most senior astronaut outside Roberts. She hasn't said a word during the presentation and resulting aftermath, but I could tell from her pale expression that she harbored fear of her own. Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. She sputtered sincerely. Sydney was the exact opposite of Roberts in almost every conceivable way, and in many respects reminded me a great deal of Dr. Begum. She had joined the NASA space program right out of college and was the first woman to set foot on the Titan at just 27 years old. The subsequent decade spent in space had taken a toll on her physical appearance, but her natural curiosity of the unknown still kept her from settling down. It's okay, I assured her, turning my head back towards the expanse of space. I could sense Sydney was equally entranced by the view before us. 
despite our now unprecedented and worrying circumstances. It was still a marvel of technical achievement to be able to see what we're seeing. The countless specks of glimmering light shining from hundreds and thousands of light years away were a living time capsule of an era long past. Is everything ready? Sydney asked half-heartedly. I could sense her unease. It was cold and familiar. Yeah, just waiting for the rest of the crew to join us before we begin charging up the engine. It felt hollow just saying those words, as I had no idea what was even powering this ship. Dr. Bigham had cherished my devotion to him and his dream, but for some reason hadn't thought it prudent to include me in every aspect of its construction. This had infuriated me before, but now it only fueled my growing discomfort at having to fill in his shoes. This was truly a case of the blind leading the blind. What do you think happened to it? Her voice trembled. Alpha Centauri? I have no idea. I have my theories, each one more implausible than the next. I finally turned to face her, but she kept her gaze forward. Sydney's almost ruby hair fell into curls all the way down to her neck, framing her narrow face. Her eyes looked glazed over, like she was seeing beyond space, beyond the cosmic horizon. I don't think I want to know. Whatever it is, it can't be good. Sydney couldn't have known just how right she was. The rest of the crew began filling in one by one, with Roberts being the last to join us. She was still trying to hide her pain behind a wall of emotional indifference, but smeared eyeliner betrayed her true heart of hearts. I felt for her and admired her supreme courage. Torrance, however, made his contempt well known, rudely brushing past me as he made his way to his co-pilot chair. Roberts made her way to the front of the bridge before stopping to gaze into the abyss. I wondered what monsters, if any, gazed back onto her. Blair, are we ready to begin? She asked blankly, not even looking back at us as she strapped herself in her chair. All systems are online and ready, I replied. Torrens, have we aligned the ship with Proxima Centauri? Torrens let out a reluctant, yes with as much venom as he could muster. Good. Begin the charging sequence, Blair. My fingers hover over the buttons needed to trigger the charging sequence. This was the moment we had all been waiting for. We were about to engage in the first faster than light voyage to another star system. This was bigger than the moon landing, bigger than anything humanity had ever attempted before. But more than that, our entire perspective of the universe was about to change in a single moment. It was a terrifying prospect, and I wasn't sure I even wanted to know what awaited us at Proxima Centauri. Blair, is there a problem? Roberts asked curtly. No, no problem, Captain. Then please begin the charging sequence. That had been the first time I had ever heard her utter the word please. Even under the circumstances, I was very much enjoying this less hardened version of Roberts. Without saying a word, I began the charging sequence. My anxiety was through the roof, and I had trouble staying focused, entering in the wrong sequence of codes more than once. It took close to two minutes before the telltale sounds of the particle accelerator connecting from the bridge to the engine room began blaring in our ears. The entire bridge began to vibrate slowly at first, but increased in intensity as the drive powered on. I looked around me, studying the crew. Some of them had locked their eyes onto me, but turned away the second mine had intercepted their own. Torrance's expression had changed from just barely contained anger to outright hostility. Sydney was still staring ahead into space along with Roberts. I only caught a glimpse of Weaver before he turned away, but his expression was one of both abject terror and hesitation. 
At long last, the charging sequence had completed, and the ship's computer informed us that the jump drive was now ready for initiation. I looked back to Roberts, who turned her head just slightly in my direction. On my command, she said. I took the longest and deepest breath I had ever taken in my life, then braced my mind, body and soul for whatever was about to come next. Roberts couldn't have known it at the time, but her next words sealed her fate, as well as ours. Initiate. There was no pause, no hesitation this time, just the flip of a single switch. All at once the sounds coming from the particle accelerator increased by almost a hundredfold. My teeth were threatening to shatter from the intense vibration that echoed through every part of my body. I could hear the surging discomfort coming from the crew. Sydney had begun hyperventilating and needed oxygen fast. But before I was able to disengage her emergency mask, the jump drive activated. What followed next was an experience that borders somewhere between pure ecstasy and a living nightmare. From the back of the ship, an enormous force started pulling us backward. I was sure I was about to face right through my chair. Space itself distorted in front of us as our view of the universe contracted and then expanded. The pressure was gargantuan, like being on a roller coaster going 1000 miles per hour. My skin had flattened against my body, the way it does when you run your hands underneath an air dryer. I couldn't even turn my head an inch to see the rest of the crew, and the roar of the ship masked any cries they made. Trillions of miles flew past in an instant, closing the gap between us and Proxima Centauri. This was it, our monumental achievement in engineering. Against all odds, it had worked. At first, the space in front of us remained dark and empty. After what felt like only seconds, a pale red dot appeared on the horizon. Proxima Centauri loomed ahead, growing bigger and brighter with each passing second. The ship's computer reminded me to begin deceleration, and with great difficulty, I moved my fingers over the switch and immediately felt the ship begin to slow down. Just moments later, the entire ship jolted and sparks began to fly from overhead. Something had impacted the ship. This was not good. A second later, another impact caused another shower of sparks to shower down all around us. Screams from some of the crew, mostly Sydney, reverberated all around me. This had not been foreseen, as there were no detectable asteroid fields along our projected path. Our calculations had been so precise. From over the chorus of voices and screams, I could hear Roberts attempting to give out orders to remain calm, but they fell upon deaf ears. Warning, damage, critical. Engage, emergency deceleration. This wasn't good. Our shield generator was failing. Blair, engage the emergency stop. Roberts ordered from underneath another torrent of sparks. We can't stop at these speeds, the g-forces will destroy the ship. Roberts protested, but I knew what would happen if I listened to her. We could do nothing but wait, pray we had cleared the debris field and stay calm. The ship stopped jolting and once the ship reached the minimum safe speed, I disengaged the jump drive. The ship lurched forward violently, nearly ripping us out of our seats. The structural integrity of the ship had held up, but only just. Multiple systems were offline, and all of our communication channels were down. I unbuckled myself quickly to begin surveying the damage, blocking out the cries and attempts at Roberts to maintain control. There were more important things to deal with right now. As far as I could see, our storage compartment housing our ground survey equipment was compromised. So, there was no telling how much equipment we had just lost. The shuttle was fully operational from what I could tell, as was the jump drive itself. But the backup generators and reserve cooling system needed to be repaired before we could even think about booting up the drive again. It was when I heard Weaver pushing himself in between Roberts and Torrance that I knew I had to intervene. 
I shouted for everyone to shut up and listen. As best as I could, I told them what we had to do right now if we wanted to stand a chance at getting back home. The energy in the room changed instantly. Despite the near-death experience and growing feuds, the crew immediately sprang into action. Roberts took advantage of this to assert control, but I could tell from several faces that this wouldn't last long. Torrance and I went to assess the cargo hold, hoping that the breach was small. We were dismayed to find the compartment had been wrecked by the breach. Several small holes had created enough suction to pull most of the equipment to the walls. Sparks were flying everywhere, and from the looks of it, our planetary surveillance rover was in pieces all over the ceiling. We would need to patch the holes before we could enter. Weaver joined us as Roberts watched on from the cockpit. She had continued to bark orders at everyone, but she was losing her cool as most of them had gone unheard or ignored. There was nothing she hated more than losing her authority. Torrance was back to his passive-aggressive routine, so that left only Weaver and me to try and maintain the peace. As we worked, my eyes kept drifting to Proxima Centauri, enraptured by its glowing red light and dominance of the pitch-black sky. We managed to patch all the holes and repressurize the compartment. Not that it did us much good. All of our data collection modules and survey equipment had been trashed, leaving us with no way to scan the planets in the Proxima Centauri system. Not that it would matter anyways. When we were back aboard the ship, Sydney dropped yet another bomb on the crew. The planet that had been our original destination was no longer detectable, just like Alpha Centauri A and B. By this point, I had lost my ability to be shocked. Torrance, in a fit of anger, swung at Weaver as he tried to come in between him and Roberts again. I dove in to try and block him and ended up getting the full brunt of his fist to my left temple. The last thing I remember is my body hitting the floor before the pitch black took over again. No dreams this time, thankfully. When I awoke, Weaver was standing over me, looking as striking as ever. He smiled at me, a smile I returned in kind. Had our circumstances been different, I'd be resisting a powerful urge to kiss him. Instead, the weight of our situation collapsed on top of me almost instantly. Weaver said that Torrance was in isolation, with Roberts just one click away from placing him back into stasis. As I got up, the wave of searing pain in my temples nearly put me back on the table. Weaver gave me some beautiful pink pill that instantly put my throbbing headache at ease. Roberts wants us all back on the bridge as soon as you're ready, Weaver replied. I silently agree and left with him at once. When we arrived back on the bridge, Torrance had been let out of isolation but was still brooding in the corner by himself. I could feel the hate radiating off of him while Roberts looked almost disheveled and not her usual self. As soon as she saw me, she walked right over and pulled me away from Weaver. Blair, I know Dr. Bigham personally selected you for this portion of the mission. However, after Torrance's outburst and the discovery of the missing planets, I'm overriding his directives and will be accompanying Torrance myself. I thought she was kidding at first, but her stern and cold expression said otherwise. With all due respects, Captain Roberts, Dr. Bigham stated, Roberts caught me off before I could even protest. I know what he said. I was there. I know how to collect and analyze data, Blair. What I don't know are the ins and outs of this ship. And if something happens to you before the ship is operational again, we might never get back to Earth. Also, there is the matter of Torrance. His behavior is unpredictable at this point, and if he gets in the way of the mission, I'm not sure you'll be able to do what is necessary to prevent him from interfering. She was right. Torrance may have hated me by that point, but I didn't think I was capable of what Roberts could effortlessly do in the same situation. So I silently nodded my head in agreement, knowing there was nothing I could do to change her mind. There was still plenty of work that needed to be done on the ship. That much was true. 
Sydney and I would also have ample opportunity to collect what data we could from the Proxima Centauri system and hopefully repair some of the damaged modules. Still, part of me yearned to see what had become of Alpha Centauri. If there was anything else left to see. Robert asked for a status update on repairs, which I told her were still ongoing, but that the shuttle was up and ready for launch. Torrance made a scene as usual when told it would be him and Roberts piloting the shuttle to the Alpha Centauri system, but was otherwise undisruptive. Roberts then told everyone that once she was off the ship, I was effectively in charge until she was back. I was to oversee the final repairs and collect what data we could. I walked the two of them to the loading dock silently, watched them suit up, then bade them one final goodbye. Roberts nodded her head in return, but I was surprised when Torrance spoke up. Good luck, soldier. There was something so stark, so brutal, the way he said those famous last words. I could only straighten my back and smile in return. The airlock doors slid into place, cutting off contact with my fellow crew for the last time. When I returned to the bridge, Weaver and Sydney were already gone, leaving just the technician Stanton and I to see the shuttle off. It was beyond breathtaking, observing faster than light travel from a distance. One second, the shuttle was drifting off in the distance. All at once, the space around it warped like the usual gravity lensing we see from black holes, but only for a brief moment. Space returned to normal as quickly as it had distorted, and a brilliant flash of concentrated light blasted off across the expanse of black space. That was the moment everything began to click into place. Come with me, Stanton, I said and began hitting out the exit. I always had a large stride, so I was out the door before he could even respond. Where are we going? he asked as he followed behind. We're going to see what makes this ship tick. Perhaps curiosity truly did kill the cat, because that was all Stanton needed. He followed me wordlessly as we navigated the labyrinthian network of passageways and chutes to the engine compartment. Dr. Bigham had made it known he wanted it to be as difficult as possible for anyone other than him to be able to access this area of the ship, and for all intended purposes, he succeeded. After what felt like an hour, we finally made it to a long, dark and narrow corridor leading to the engine room. The door required a series of complex puzzles, almost like a video game, along with the chief science officer's code that was now mine. I almost laughed out loud, realizing how silly and over the top this all was. But that was the doctor, heart, body and soul. At last, the familiar hissing of the hydraulics sounded that the door was opening. What lay before us was about the most mundane and boring room you could ever hope to find on a ship. Dr. Bigham, the troll, was definitely starting to come out. The whole room was white, save for a perfectly round black spherical area that filled the entire middle of the room and dipped significantly into the floor, at least a yard or more. A manual computer station, hidden behind a wall, began unfolding its way out as we walked into the room. Stanton and I stood in awe, or maybe befuddlement, I'm not sure which. The sphere was a series of segmented plates, made of what looked like marble. I ran my fingers over it, and could feel it was still warm to touch despite it having been hours since the ship had stopped. I was trying to piece together how any of this made sense. When I looked to the floor and saw a series of words written all around the spherical dip, it was the same phrase repeated over and over again. Outer Event Horizon Limit. 
the pieces began fitting together almost perfectly. The particle accelerator, the event horizon room, the jump drive. It was such a feat of engineering, yet elegant in its simplicity. My mouth dropped just slightly. Freaking incredible, was all I could say. What? What is it? Stanton asked. It's a black hole. That's what powers the jump drive. It warps the space around the ship, then the particle accelerator propels the ship forward. It's freaking brilliant, actually. Holy shit, should we even be in here? Stanton was beginning to sound panicked, and I don't blame him. As impressive as it was, it was scary just how close to an actual potential black hole we were standing. Probably not, but I'm sure it's turned off. How do you know? We wouldn't be standing here right now if it was. Our atoms would be smashed all over the room. This seemed to calm him. I wanted to explore more, but then the ship's intercom blared overhead. Blair, Stanton, we need you in the observation room. It was Sydney's voice, sounding garbled and worried over the speaker. We left without a word, navigating our way back to the central hub much faster than before. When we arrived, Weaver and Sydney were off in separate corners of the room. Sydney, hovering over her computer screens, looked almost startled to see us come in. What's the problem? I asked, fearing more bad news. Well, I'm not sure. It's hard to explain. Sydney seemed flustered and on the verge of a breakdown. We all were, from the looks of it. When we arrived, I began plotting out a star map to see what the constellations looked like from here. For the most part, there was little variation. Was? I responded. I wasn't liking where this was going. Yeah, well, when I was playing back some of the first recordings, I noticed stars that seemed to disappear and reappear, almost at identical intervals. I can't explain it, the whole star vanishes and then reappears just as quickly. It's like something is moving in front of it. But if that were the case, not only would it have to be beyond gigantic, but it would have to be much, much closer to us. Sydney stumbled over her words as if she herself didn't believe what she was saying. Even after everything that had already happened, this was yet more fuel to add to our growing nightmare. I was about to interject when the overhead intercom sounded again, this time from the ship's automated computer. Danger, collision with shuttle imminent, T-10 minutes until impact. What? Are they back already? Sydney and the rest of us began rushing to the observation deck. We gazed from inside the nearly two foot thick glass for the shuttle. If they were adrift without the ability to maneuver, then we would have to go spacewalk to retrieve it from hitting the ship. But the other possibilities that sprang from this were far worse. What happened to Roberts and Torrance? Why were they back already? Why couldn't they control the ship? We scanned the black horizon for any sign of the shuttle. It was Stanton that spotted it first. There it is, he said as he pointed upwards off to our left. Sure enough, just barely visible and about quarter of a mile out of the shuttle, drifting slowly towards us. The emergency lights could be seen flashing, but other than that, it looked completely abandoned. What do you think happened? Sydney inquired. I don't know. Weaver, you come with me. Stanton and Sydney, you both make sure the docking area is prepped. We broke into our groups and made haste. Weaver and I suited up and entered the cold vacuum of space yet again in record time. As soon as we tethered the ship, we propelled ourselves towards the approaching shuttle. As we got closer, several things became clear all at once. The airlock doors were open, leaving the cockpit completely compromised. I scanned for any damage, but so far the shuttle looked to be in fine working condition. Weaver entered before me and began locking the doors so we could re-establish the atmosphere and put the ship's computer back up. I ordered him to keep his suit on, just in case. I had no idea what to expect and wanted us to be as protected as possible. My instincts turned out to be correct. As I was gathering the shuttle's flight recorder to take back with us, Weaver had tended to search the shuttle for our missing comrades. 
Just as I was removing the shuttle's flight recorder from its wall panel, a commotion sprung up behind me. I spun around to see Weaver now being throttled by another figure in a spacesuit, who I assumed to be either Torrance given his prior behavior. From the looks of it, they had been hiding in the storage locker and jumped Weaver once he opened the door. I reached for the electrical prod from my utility belt, but Weaver was slammed right into me by the suited figure before I could, knocking me to the floor and nearly taking the wind out of me. Weaver was short of breath and could only give me a confused, desperate look before he was launched to the other side of the cabin, banging up against the airlock. Standing above me now was the suited figure, whose visor had been pulled all the way down, masking their identity. I motioned to get up, but was slammed down to the ground by the figure, stomping on my arm and almost fracturing it. In its right hand was the utility axe equipped with all our spacesuits. Just as the axe began to swing down on my head, its body began surging and jolting. From behind, I could see Weaver ramming his electrical prod into the figure over and over again, but nothing seemed to phase it. Seizing the moment, I unclipped my own axe and with only seconds to spare, slammed the metal edge into the side of the figure's helmet, shattering the visor, and finally the suited menace slumped to the floor, me alongside it. For a moment, it was all quiet. Weaver, start the docking procedure. I managed to wheeze out. Weaver went to the cockpit, and within moments, I could feel the ship beginning to automatically pilot towards the loading docks. My gaze, however, was still locked onto the now smashed visor of our attacker. The looming form of the faceless, reflective black suit was terrifying enough. But it was what I didn't see that truly horrified me. I was gazing into the dark space where the person wearing the suit's face should have been, but there was nothing there. I crawled over the figure, expecting it to leap back to life at any moment. It lay still as I brought my face inches to the visor, still staring into that blank void. There was nothing, no eyes, no skin, no face. Nothing. I reached into the visor, fingers outstretched. The very tip of my pointer finger made contact with something invisible and fleshy. There was enough for me to recall my hand back and shriek out loud. What? What's wrong? Weaver had sprung into action at the sound of my distress, hands locked onto his prod. I just shook my head and backed into a corner. The shuttle jolted as it docked with the Arkham and I could hear the airlock pressurize and the voices of Sydney and Stanton sound off from just beyond the doors. But nothing could rip my eyes from the horror of what lay in front of me. Blair, are you hurt? What's wrong? Weaver had never sounded more concerned, and it was this concern that finally snapped me out of my daze. The airlock doors opened, and Sydney rushed in, followed by Stanton. Is everyone okay? We heard fighting over the intercom. Sydney was surveying the scene and saw the crumpled figure in front of us. Who's that? We're not sure yet. They attacked us both as we were getting the shuttle back to the docking platform, Weaver explained. There's nothing there, I said under my breath. What? What do you mean? Weaver asked as he looked towards our suited attacker. But I could see the flash of recognition go across his face as he saw what I saw. What? What happened? Sydney began, but she too saw that nothing was inhabiting the suit. Stanton began moving towards it, but I urged him to stop. I simply grabbed the cord that had tethered us to the ship and began wrapping it around the suit. What are you doing? Sydney sounded almost accusatory. I'm not taking any chances. Weaver joined me in tying up our attacker, and once we were sure it was secure, both of us dragged the suit to the medical bay. Strapped to a table, we tried to break off the suit, but something had happened that had infused multiple parts of the suit and shredded it in other places. Weaver had found some baking powder and used it to spread a layer over where the face of the wearer should be. Sure enough, the form of Robert's face became clear as Weaver coated it with the powder, though her features were warped and upon closer inspection. 
her skin appeared to be moving and distorting. I was baffled. The behavior of the suited figure had led me to suspect it was Torrens, but clearly it was not. Now an even darker question loomed. As he could read my mind, Stanton spoke first. If this is Roberts, then where's Torrens? Nobody had an answer. I remembered the flight recorder, grabbed it without a word, then turned to leave. Stay here and guard her, or whatever that is. I'm getting some goddamn answers. I sped out. I was beyond scared, beyond terrified, beyond confused. The events surrounding us were only getting stranger by the minute. Whatever happened on the shuttle at Alpha Centauri, I knew it held the answers we sought. Footsteps sounded behind me, and I looked to see Weaver running up alongside me. I'm coming with you. No, please, wait with the others. If that thing wakes up, Sydney and Stanton can handle it. Besides, I want to know what happened on that shuttle too. I smiled and silently admired Weaver for his natural curiosity and spirit despite these dire circumstances. We walked briskly back to the central hub, flight recorder in tow, and began the process of accessing the data. The Arkham's communication systems were still completely offline, and so we had to upload the data manually. While we waited, I began pulling up the video archives. Weaver and I watched as Roberts and Torrance took off in the shuttle as they approached the binary star system. That was when things began to shift. The video files became increasingly corrupted, and Roberts and Torrance faded in and out of sea of multicolor static. The audio, though corrupted as well, remained audible at least for the most horrific parts. Roberts was heard over the recorder, shouting and screaming unintelligibly, while Torrance tried to get her under control. The cabin rocked back and forth, as if pushed from something on the outside. What's happening? The ship stopped. All systems down. Roberts, what? Roberts looked to be in a trance from the few clips that managed to get through the static. A split second later, she was gone. It was as if she just faced out of existence. Roberts, where the hell? Roberts, Roberts! The audio caught off for a moment, only to resume with the sounds of horrified yelling in the shuttle's computer systems. Warning, airlock systems deactivated. Cabin depressurizing in 30 seconds. What are you? Stop! Roberts, what are you doing? Stop! No! The last split second image we saw before the video cut out for good was of a suited Roberts by the airlock doors in a frantic Torrens grabbing hold of his seat for dear life before the airlock doors opened, sucking Torrens out of the frame and into the void of space. I thankfully looked away before the worst of it, but judging from the look on Weaver's face, he'd gotten a full look at Torrens's rapid decompression as his screams of agony were sharply cut off. The video and audio stopped after that. The silence in the room was deafening. Once more, all I could detect was our shallow breaths as we absorbed the horror show that had unfolded before us. What the hell was all Weaver could muster? A message flashed on the computer screen, telling us that the data had been fully processed and was ready. Hesitantly, I moved the cursor to the files and one by one, numerous screens and charts began loading onto my screen. From what I could gather, as the shuttle had approached the site of Alpha Centauri, long-range telescopes began picking up two small bodies of mass in the exact position of the two stars. Though the temperature readings were cooler than any stellar body detected, and the size of the objects were roughly the same as Earth, they both had a mass far greater than anything a planet could substance. It took me a bit longer than normal to come up with the hypothesis, but once it emerged, it nearly took my breath away. I sat back in my chair, shaking my head in disbelief at what I was looking at. Something that had never been discovered before. Something that shouldn't even exist yet. That's not possible, I whispered to myself. What? What's not possible? Weaver was scared, but his fear was nothing compared to mine. 
I was silent for a moment more, still in utter shock at this newfound discovery. Alpha Centauri, it's still there, but it's become a black dwarf. An icy chill ran all down my body and back up my spine as I said those last words. What's a black dwarf? I didn't expect him to know what it meant. How could he? It was an almost empty and unexplored area of the celestial sciences. It shouldn't exist. It couldn't exist. It was a complete impossibility. This was no lie, however. No trick. No deception. The very first black dwarf discovered by man was less than half a light year away. Black dwarfs are the stellar remnants of white dwarfs after they've cooled to almost absolute zero. It's the final stage of all stars that don't turn into black holes, I explained. So what's the problem? The problem is, these things shouldn't exist yet. The time it takes for a white dwarf to cool is estimated to far exceed the known age of the universe. We're talking quadrillions of years here. But that's impossible. Apparently not, I sarcastically remarked, though the humor was lost amongst the tension and fear that had taken hold since the moment I had awoken from hypersleep. It felt like some fever dream, an ungodly nightmare that I kept hoping and praying would end, that I would awake in my hypersleep chamber, that Dr. Bigham would still be alive and we would be on our way to make history, ensuring our names are engraved within science books for all time. Reality had been a cruel mistress, and I had an awful feeling she wasn't done yet. What do we do? Weaver sounded more desperate than ever, though I had no answers to offer this time. I don't know if there's anything we can do. If whatever caused this change has made its way to Proxima... My words trailed off. The mysterious fluctuations in light output the shifting constellation Sydney had reported. Somewhere, something primordial was awakening. Just as those insidious thoughts penetrated my mind, the now ominous voice of the ship's computer sounded off once more. Attention, all personnel report to Medical Bay. Several crew members have experienced catastrophic injury. Catastrophic injury? I cringed and shuddered at what that could entail. Weaver and I gave one wordless glance to each other before jolting upwards and running down the long corridors to the medical bay. When the doors opened automatically, my eyes were immediately assaulted with a sense of horror I'd only ever seen in movies. I could only register the image of blood coating nearly every surface before the churning in my stomach overpowered me and I twisted downwards to void the contents of my stomach. Though. I was sure I caught the glimpse of what looked like a severed arm hanging off a table. Weaver didn't handle it much better than I did, and we both nearly fell backward into the corridor, the stench of iron clinging to the air. What the actual fuck? I'd never heard Weaver curse before. He had remained so composed, more so than all of us, yet it was this breakdown and curse that truly broke me. At the moment, I was convinced none of us were getting back to Earth alive. Sydney, Stanton, Torrance, Roberts, whatever has inhabited her form, was now loose aboard the ship. There's no telling where it could be now. I darted my head, looking down the corridors, half expecting it to come around the corner at any moment. Airlock breached. Warning. Depressurization in loading dock. The blaring alarm and booming voice from the computer barely registered at first. It took Weaver shaking me and grabbing me off of the floor to break me free. We gotta go! Come on, Blair! Weaver was reasserting control, and it was all I needed to free my mind. We both grabbed our helmets and began running towards the loading docks. We turned the corner when the airtight doors dropped down almost directly in front of us. Just a few steps further, and it would have split us right down the middle. Ship atmosphere compromised. Sealing all airtight doors. From behind the now sealed doors, we could hear the pull of space sucking everything it could into the vacuum. A loud bang came from the doors. Whatever was on the other side, 
It knew we were here, and it was coming for us. My heart skipped a beat, and I contemplated the entirety of my life and everything that had led to this moment. I was half tempted to throw open the doors and launch myself into space, letting the void carry me into eternity. Something else was stirring inside of me though, a feeling I had never known before. It felt animalistic and raw. No, I wasn't ready to give up just yet. The fight to survive overpowered my fear for the first time. One way or another, this was going to end right here and now. Thinking on my feet, I called to Weaver. Put your helmet on. I've got an idea. Weaver didn't question it and fastened his helmet on just as quickly as I did. We both hitched ourselves to the wall, and once I was in place, I silently looked over at Weaver, now unsure if this was a good idea. I peered deep into his eyes, looking for any sign that I should stop. But he only nodded to me, and that was all I needed to feel that surge of adrenaline again. My heart now racing and the heat in my head swelling, I took the plunge and deactivated the airtight doors. The moment they opened, the cold vacuum of space roared back to life, pulling us with great force towards it. The suction only lasted a few seconds, and soon the weightlessness of zero gravity surrounded us both. Looking ahead, I could only see Roberts, or what she had now become, floating in the doorway. Large chunks of the suit had been ripped off, and now the form that inhabited her remains looked more menacing than ever. There was no warning, no sound, nothing. All at once, the form charged full speed I had towards us. I braced myself for impact, but couldn't have predicted the force at which it slammed into me. The jumbled mass of ripped fabric and bent metal began lunging at me, doing whatever it could to land as much damage as possible. I reached for my utility axe, but this time it had expected this and ripped it right out of my hands. Its gloved fists started pummeling into my suit and visor. Just as I thought, it would shatter the visor as I had done before. Weaver charged in from my side and slammed my attacker into the wall. My head was spinning from the attack and I couldn't see straight at first. I watched as Weaver attempted to subdue the creature, but with no success. After trying to break his visor with its fist and failing, it tried a new tactic and began slamming its face over and over into Weaver's. I knew he only had seconds left. Summoning all the strength I could, I propped my feet against the wall and launched my body with as much force as I could muster towards the airlock. Arms outstretched, I grabbed hold of the suited menace and carried us away through the corridor and towards the open mouth of space. Just before we reached the gateway, the suit twisted around and pushed us into the airlock walls. It started banging its head into mine with such ferocity. One crack appeared, then two, then more. At that moment, I surrendered to my fate. I said a small prayer for Weaver and reached for my prod. This was it. I was on the edge of oblivion, and I wasn't taking any prisoners. With every last bit of energy I had left, I activated the prod and pushed it straight into the open visor and deep into the suit. The suit convulsed and threw the small bit of powder still left. I watched as a look of pure agony was permanently etched into her face. Just as quickly as it began, its arms went limp and the convulsions stopped. The now motionless form drifted slowly backward and through the gateway, out of the ship and into space. I was becoming lightheaded from the escaping oxygen and quickly closed the airlock doors to re-establish the atmosphere. I tried to stand up but my body was beginning to crash from the adrenaline spike. So I tumbled down onto the floor as the gravity turned back on. My breathing became shallow, and once again, I was ready to surrender. Though it lasted only half a minute at best, the fight felt like I had climbed Mount Everest in a single minute. My heart was throbbing and at a risk of exploding through my ribs. The motion of someone removing my helmet and the rush of fresh air now filling my lungs brought me clarity. 
I looked up to see Weaver's worried but smiling face just inches from mine and thought at that moment that I'd never seen a more handsome man in my life. I smiled back and laughed. Weaver laughed in return, and for once, the tension and dread that had filled us both was momentarily gone. He pulled me back to my feet, and slowly we made our way back to the central hub. I locked the doors and sealed the windows, though I'm not sure why. They wouldn't do as much good against whatever force of nature lurked just beyond. We both slunk to the floor, exhausted and unsure of what to say or do next. Weaver was the first to break the silence with a single question. So, what is your hypothesis, doctor? He was attempting to be funny and let out a forced chuckle that I returned in kind. But to be fair, it was a valid question. I had been so lost in confusion and panic that I never really thought about the possibilities. What had happened to Captain Roberts? What had corrupted her and why? What thing transformed Alpha Centauri into a cosmic graveyard? I'm not sure. I think maybe some sort of life form, but big, massive, something that would need an enormous amount of energy to survive. I thought about Roberts and how some part of her remained on that operating table. The way her skin moved and folded, she had either become invisible or assimilated somehow by this entity. This was the most puzzling of all. What had consumed her? What exactly was this thing made of? Normal baryonic matter seemed unlikely. What were the alternatives? The way it had reacted to the electric prod had been telling. I thought of more exotic forms of matter, such as dark matter and antimatter. We've never observed them before and don't know if they even exist. But if they did exist and there was enough of it gathered in one place, then there's no telling what could happen. Life sprung from literal hellfire during the early days of Earth. What would stop life from arising from the cold and empty tomb of space? It doesn't matter what it is. Not anymore. I said dejectedly. It was the hard truth, but the truth nonetheless. We sat in silence once more. I'm not sure for how long. Maybe a minute. Maybe an hour. The ship's computer, which had comically been the bearer of bad news, had one last omen of bad fortune to give us and immediately caught our attention. Attention, abnormal gravitational anomaly detected. I jumped up and made my way to the window, standing as close as I could. I searched. It didn't take long to find it. From afar, space and light from the stars began to warp in odd, undefinable ways. It seemed like the very fabric of space and time was folding and unfolding, twisting the constellations into something unrecognizable. The Arkham was positioned roughly two light minutes away, giving us plenty of space to watch the scene unfold safely, relatively speaking, but close enough for us to get a full view of Proxima Centauri's final fate. There are some events that defy explanation. No words invented by mankind could ever sum up the fear, horror, and pure existential dread witnessing that behemoth devour the Red Dwarf. I'm sure that, no matter how long I live, every time I close my eyes, that haunting image will be there, waiting for me. As the mass got closer, I could see small strands of superheated plasma began to break away from the Red Dwarf. I watched in a mix of awe and horror as this monster of the universe began to cannibalize the last member of the Centauri system. The entire scene would have looked spectacular had it not been so nightmarish. Weaver was standing next to me, and all I wanted at that moment was another human to hold, to connect to, to protect me. Almost on instinct, I reached for his hand and wrapped my fingers around his. He didn't resist. In fact, he gripped my hand in his own. God Almighty! I'd never been a religious person myself, but Weaver's words seem more than appropriate. 
we have to do something. I said, though I knew it was futile. As small and insignificant as we were, what could we do to fight against this gigantic leviathan? There was no force of nature we could harness that would stand a chance at annihilating this thing. Nothing. Outside of a black hole. I had completely forgotten about the engine room. It was a lifetime away, even though it couldn't have been more than a few hours ago. I know what we have to do. I said plainly, my mind now racing to formulate a plan. I explained the engine room black hole generator and how it was what powered the warp drive. If we could pilot the ship into Proxima Centauri and breach the event horizon, that would result in an enormous explosion that should tear apart whatever it is. I was giddy as the plan began to unfold. We might actually have a chance at saving ourselves and potentially everyone back on Earth. Can we remote pilot the ship from the shuttle? Weaver asked. And just like that, my moment of glory had already collapsed and I could feel the collar drain from my face. The communication systems aboard the Arkham had never been fixed and now it was too late to attempt any repairs. We can't, not from the shuttle. We have to pilot the ship manually, which means Weaver cut me off and finished my sentence himself. One of us will have to stay behind. Of course, there was always a catch, a price to be paid. My search for the ultimate questions of the universe was what led me here, and now it was only fitting that I'd be the one to stay behind and witness the end of my journey. You go in the shuttle. I'll stay behind. I offered selflessly. There was no hesitation. So many of my questions had been answered. And though so many remained, I no longer wanted the answers. No, you have to go. I expect him to say that. I was just about to refute him, but he stopped me. He grabbed my shoulders softly and looked deep beyond my eyes, into my very soul. Stop. We don't have time to argue about this. Because of you and Dr. Bigham, I got the opportunity to be part of something so much bigger than myself. Something that is going to change the course of human history. It was you and the doctor that got us here. But the people back on Earth, they still need you. What if there are more of these things? With the jump drive, humanity will truly have the keys to the stars. But that won't happen if you don't make it back. You have to go. Tears had already begun to pull around my eyes as he spoke. I didn't want to listen, but I knew that. He was right. There was no guarantee the shuttle would even survive the return trip. It was a miracle we had even survived in the first place. The thought of some other abomination hiding in the dark, hungry and searching for another star, made it all too clear what we had to do. But I wasn't going to leave Weaver behind. Not without telling him the truth. Weaver, I... I couldn't say it. I wasn't even sure what it was. I had never felt this way about another human before. And our time together had been so short. It wasn't fair. Why did it have to be this way? He just looked into my eyes. The way he did before. Then wrapped his arms around me in an embrace. His salt and peppered hair was so soft. And his skin so warm. His voice was velvety smooth. As he spoke into my ear. I know. We then stared into each other's eyes. Knowing it would be for the last time. It was a moment I never thought would happen. It was small. Maybe only half a minute. But that was all I needed. The passion that burned between us though. Would have outshone the sun. After it was over. I looked back up. And spoke the last words. I would ever say to him. You know what to do? He only nodded his head. Before I was overcome with grief, I tore myself from his arms and headed towards the exit. As I left, I took one last look behind me. Weaver had already begun strapping himself into the cockpit and beginning the launch sequence. His eyes met mine 
for one final time. He smiled weakly and without a word. I turned on my heel and ran as fast as I could into the loading dock. It had become easy to navigate the ship by this point, so I was on board and beginning my own launch sequence within minutes. I watched as the Arkham faded quickly into view, marveling one last time at Dr. Bacon's creation. I still didn't know how he created the black hole engine and had no idea where to start. I could only hope and pray I would live long enough to find out. I began activating the engine and particle accelerator, then charted a path far out into the Proxima system. I couldn't leave without making sure Weaver had succeeded. The titanic gravitational pull from before was much less intense given the smaller size of the shuttle, but still strong. Piloting had not been my strongest area of training, but I handled the shuttle easily enough, much to my astonishment. When the jump drive disengaged, I turned the ship back around to face Proxima Centauri, which was now little more than a fuzzy red dot in the distance. The distortions from the entity and lensing effect could still be seen as well, only on a much smaller scale. I waited, and waited, and waited. After a few minutes, I began to fear something had happened to the ship and was ready to drive straight into the star myself. But then, it happened. Without any warning, an enormous burst of light shined like a thousand burning suns. I shielded my eyes as best as I could and waited. There was no sound, no vibrations. I was much too far away to feel anything. But as the light faded, I was finally able to see it happen. The black hole was now sucking the entire mass of Proxima Centauri into the event horizon, and from the looks of it, the entity as well. The space and time distortion spiked for just a second before warping inwards and towards the singularity. The rest of the red dwarf began to spread around into a bright accretion disk. Before now, Proxima had never been visible to the naked eye. But within four years, it would be one of the brightest objects in the night sky. I waited for what must have been hours. I had to be sure. I needed to be certain it was dead. Nothing emerged. No more distortions, no detection of the anomaly. As far as I could tell, it had crossed the inner horizon and was now being shredded to its most basic particles around the singularity. It was only after I was certain it was gone that I felt the first sign of relief since I had woken up. They say in space, no one can hear you scream. Though I'm sure if you were listening, you could have heard me crying. I sobbed, screamed, cursed, yelled. It came out all at once. The floodgates opened and I couldn't close them. Afterwards, I sat in the cockpit and just stared out into space. Since I was a kid, I'd always seen it as the final frontier. A never-ending fountain of questions just waiting to be solved. But now, I know the truth. Some things aren't meant to be discovered. Some questions are better left unanswered. After wiping the last tears from my face, I began plotting my course back to Seoul. Before I was about to engage the autopilot, I thought of the mammoth journey that lay ahead of me. There were a thousand things that could go wrong. What if this shuttle had been damaged somehow during the assault? What if I died in hypersleep like Dr. Bigham? I couldn't risk not leaving behind a record of these events to show the people of Earth what Weaver, Roberts, Torrance, Sidney, Stanton, and Dr. Bigham gave to protect them. It will be my greatest failure should this message not reach you. I'm broadcasting on all radio frequencies and sending this message through all channels. My only hope is that someone, somewhere back on Earth, finds this before they find you. My name 
is Damien Blair, junior astrophysicist and the last survivor of the space research vehicle, Arkham, and I'm coming home. <laughs>